My name is Diana Fox Carney, and I'm delighted to be moderating this discussion uh, today, the first in a series that we are doing to try and learn lessons uh, from Europe, share lessons from Europe uh, for Canada, and hopefully the other way around too, on building back better and building a green future for our countries and our continents. So uh, before I introduce the panelists, I'm going to pass over to Toby Heaps, uh, many of you know, know uh, to introduce the series. Thank you, Toby. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I, I hope you had a, a great summer. Um, many of you that are here uh, joined us back in the spring when we hosted a series on building back better together, bringing Canadian industry and, and government together. And over the course of that, um, we did have two questions looming. One was, what kind of recovery are we going to have? And the second was, will we be um, putting sufficient firepower, fiscal firepower into the recovery? Will it be big or will it be small? Over the summer, uh, those questions were uh, clarified. The European Union uh, is made, made clear that they will be injecting a trillion dollars into a green recovery and Canadian funds. Uh, Canada's throne speech made clear that the green recovery will be the cornerstone of our economic recovery. Cornerstone was the language used and it will, will be big. How big is um, being drawn up and worked on right now in terms of the implementation? And so we're bringing everyone together over the, the coming weeks, um, over five sessions with many of our European colleagues in partnership with the, uh, the German embassy in Canada and for this session with the French embassy as well to look closely at what our colleagues are doing in Europe and have some sharing going on so we can figure out exactly how we're gonna recover, what we're gonna focus on, or um, if we're gonna take more of a broad-based sort of scattergun approach, but it, it looks like there's there's some lessons that we can draw from our colleagues in Europe. And so without further ado, I'll pass it back to Diana and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Uh, so today's uh, event, in today's event, we're really going to think about three questions. One is how uh, this crisis is similar or different from the crisis of 2008. Second is what we learned from that uh, and what might be relevant to our efforts to build back now. And the third is this question of uh, learning across uh, different jurisdictions, different nations, um, how we make uh, ensure that what we do now makes us more sustainable and resilient for the future. So to get us going, I'm going to invite our two uh, ambassadors who are joining us today uh, and who've uh, sponsored this event today uh, to give us an update on what is going in the, on in their countries and any thoughts uh, they might have about the relevance to Canada. So we're going to uh, start with uh, the German ambassador, Sabina Sparwasser, uh, who is fortunate to be from a country that is held up uh, as one of the examples of how to manage COVID. Uh, and hopefully how to manage a recovery. So thank you for, for your support, Sabina, and, and welcome. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, building back better has become the driving motto now for all our countries. And I think the pandemic and the terrible losses of lives and livelihoods and climate change and its obvious devastations have really been a call to action for all of us. I do really hope that I'm right when I say that we in Germany and in the European Union, we have heard the shot. Um, I think we have understood that we must transform and we need more ambitious climate targets, faster energy transition, clean mobility, smart and sustainable and livable cities and so on. When I say we heard the shot, uh, I certainly think our citizens have. 92% uh, of EU citizens want ambitious targets for renewables. 80% uh, are confident that that will create jobs and make us more competitive in the future. And I do believe our industry gets it too. Many German companies in particular are asking for strong climate targets. They want them. Many are leading in the world when it comes to sustainable innovation. And I certainly think our governments have now done their part. We had in Germany what our finance minister called the big bazooka. It was the big stimulus package of 130 billion euros. That's about $200 billion. Um, um, and the EU has done the same. The package for the EU is 1.8 trillion euros. That's a number with 18 zeros, I counted. 
and this is an historic investment into recovery. In both Germany and the EU, more than one third of that enormous amount of investment is dedicated to the Green Deal, to technological innovation, investment into a better future. And um, I don't want to go into details, I'll be very brief, but I just want to mention one example, hydrogen. Germany invests 9 billion euros now into developing hydrogen as an alternative uh, type of energy. Um, and I think this is one of the examples, and I hope it will come up later in the webinar, where we can achieve real transformation and where in particular Canada, which is a potential hydrogen superpower, and Europe can achieve an awful lot together. There are many other areas, but this is an interesting one. Just thank you very much to Toby Heaps, to Diana, to Corporate Knights for being such drivers and thought leaders for sustainable change. I really look forward to the webinar and wish us stimulating this uh, discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sabina. Uh, perhaps, Chris, uh, you could put up now just the slide uh, to show briefly that per capita spend, Sabina mentioned the, uh, the amounts of money that have been uh, dedicated in the European Union. And we have a slide that shows Canada versus the European Union. Uh, there we go. So um, UK, where I used to live, bottom of the pile there. Um, but Canada is doing, is doing uh, pretty well. Uh, so I don't think we need to be disheartened um, by our efforts. So that was just a, a background. Okay, let's move on now. Um, uh, I want to now bring in the French ambassador, Corinne Rispal, uh, to talk a little bit about what's going on in France. Thank you, Corinne. Hi. Hello. So, uh, good morning, Canadians, and uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, Europeans. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here to co-host this meeting um, and support the German presidency of the EU, who is really, really involved in promoting green economy. So, Sabine, it's my great pleasure to be with you here, and I want to acknowledge um, Claire Tutenui as well, because in a previous life, I was working in the private sector and my company was part of uh, Entreprise pour l'Environnement. So as we know, all our countries have been hit uh, hard by the economic crisis due to, to COVID. And uh, in France, we are expecting a 9% a nine drop in GDP in 2029%. That's huge. So what we have learned from the past is that we don't want to go the way uh, we've been uh, acting. And uh, it's true that, especially because it's going to be the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, um, we really know that the recovery should be different. And um, even if it's going to be a long pass, uh, we think that it's going to be um, a crucial part of uh, acting uh, to avoid a nightmare scenario. But it is also the only way to create growth and job opportunities. So in France, we just launched the, the third plan, the France Relance, um, the France Relance plan. Uh, so first, during the, 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 the pandemic, uh, we, we had some kind of emergency measures, and then we adopted some sectoral plans. And then now we launched this uh, major plan, which is a, uh, a plan uh, of uh, 100 billion. Um, 30 of them will be just focused on green recovery and uh, will be uh, dedicated to accelerating uh, the ecologic transition uh, through key sectors, rotation, building, hydrogen goal. And um, the rule for uh, this new budget, and that's really new, is that each measure that we adopted must both create jobs and reduce um, greenhouse gas emission. And that's the first time that we are presenting a budget that is really uh, made according to um, these environmental criteria. Um, so with this plan, we hope to uh, reduce our CO2 emission by 60 million ton of CO2. And thanks to the um, EU plan, um, the, the next generation plan um, that has been pushed forward by France and Germany, uh, we hope that um, we will do even better. 
Um, I, would, I just want to add a point because we had this discussion when we were preparing the, the session about, you know, uh, how French population stands uh, uh, in, uh, in front of a green recovery and the attitude of people because some of you have mentioned the yellow jackets, like uh, it was a proof that people were reluctant to have any measures uh, uh, to, to, to make the green recovery possible, but I think it's a, it's a mistake. This yellow jacket was more a protestation because uh, people felt, felt that uh, it was not fair because it was always the poorest that were paying more taxes. But um, it was more a, a push for more uh, social justice. But it was not against green recovery. It was not against climate change. And uh, we've seen in our last three elections, the European elections, um, the municipal elections, and even um, the senator elections, every time Green Party has been doing very, very well. So I think this is really a sign that the French population is ready for green recovery and really willing to make progress and to make it happen. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I'm pleased to hear that the French as well as the German populations are behind this direction of travel. I actually just want to have a quick audience poll here to start us off on this question of jobs versus green. And I know there, it, it is a false dichotomy uh, to a large extent because we've shown that green measures can be much more jobs intensive than regular kind of brownfield measures that we're used to around infrastructure, et cetera. However, I think there is a question of what comes first. So are you thinking primarily in terms of developing a green economy or are you thinking primarily in terms of whatever it takes to get people back into the workforce? So I just want to get the audience's sense on this, uh, which is really primary, even though the two are extremely, or which should be primary, even though the two are um, very related. And I will feed back uh, the results of that question uh, later on um, in, in, the F in, in this event. But for now, um, I want to now invite Don Drummond uh, to uh, kick us off in our discussion. Many of you will have know Don from you know, his, his past life as well as his present one. He's presently uh, at Queen's where he's the Stouffer Dunning Fellow um, on uh, an adjunct professor at the School of Policy Studies, but he was, of course, the uh, chief economist for TD Bank during the 2008 crisis, uh, and perhaps can talk to us a little bit about the importance of uh, a green recovery. Thank you, Don. Thanks very much, and a good day to everybody. I was asked to speak of an article I wrote recently on how clean growth is, or at least should be, Canada's future, and I did that with the new Canadian Institute on Climate Choices. But I'm very happy to put that more directly into the context of your conference, going back to the financial crisis. Um, one of the things that always strikes me about the financial crisis is I, I cannot believe it was just 12 years ago. It seems to me like virtually everything in the world, environment and economy and public policy has changed in a relatively short period of time. As Diana said, I, I was right in the heart of this uh, financial crisis 12 years ago, working for Canada's second largest bank. But I look back on it, it doesn't seem to be as big and difficult and complex as we seemed to think at the time. We had a need to restore liquidity, and central banks did unprecedented actions to do that. And it needed to have aggregate demand bolstered, and there were very large stimulus packages from virtually every country around the world, including Canada's. But the fiscal stimulus was fairly conventional and it was a myopic approach to just getting things going and only really worrying about a very short period of time. And in fact, pretty much right around the world, including in Canada, the fiscal stimulus only lasted for pretty much precisely 24 months. And all countries, again, Canada completely shifted to austerity before long before the economies recovered. So it, it barely met its need of getting the economy going, but it really gave no lasting benefits whatsoever. I think governments of today, just 12 years later, should have a lot more things on their mind than they did at that time. And I think the good news is they are, appear to have that. As we struggle through around the world with COVID-19, there's no doubt a need to bolster aggregate demand. But unlike uh, 12 years ago, there's a very severe hit to aggregate supply as, as well. And that requires different policy approaches. 
I think the Canada Canadian context has changed a lot. We have been extraordinarily slow in Canada to realize we are slipping into a permanently lower growth rate track unless we do something about it. We had very one very robust growth track coming out of the Second World War that lasted in the mid '70s. We sort of settled in the growth path, and very few have actually realized where we are in the process right now to going to yet a lower one that is going to jeopardize increases in Canadians' incomes, well-being, and our ability to have sustainable finances and, and pay for goods. So when one thinks about doing something in terms of recovery from the shock that we're in from COVID-19, I don't think we have the luxury the way we exploited the last time around to think about it as slowly as a short-term issue. We must look at it a longer-term issue. Secondly, the context for the Canadian economic structure has changed so completely in 12 years. In 2008, we were in the ninth year of a resource boom that was driving almost all of our resource prices up through the roof. We were creating a huge number of jobs. We, of course, focused disproportionately on the oil patch, but it was lifting all the resources. We had started a trend decline in the importance of our big manufacturing sector, but it was fairly early days. So if we fast forward to 12 years, we're now in the sixth year of virtually a depression right across the resource sector. The talk of 12 years ago, reaching things like uh, oil supply peak have been, uh, which would actually be good for Canada, have been replaced by talk of uh, peak in oil demand, which of course bodes very poorly for Canada. And we're now uh, at the end of our second decade in a trend decline in our manufacturing job. And with that, a tremendous loss of well-paying jobs that came with benefits. Now, just a moment on the environment. That too seems to have changed. 2008, even many environmentalists believed that you had a binary choice. You could have a sound environment or you could have economic growth, but you couldn't have both. And I think there's a much greater willingness to accept that with smart strategies, you can have both and you should proceed to have both. I think even environments has broadened out their focus. Uh, 12 years ago, the focus was almost singularly on emissions. And now people are realizing you have to focus on a broader set of measures of quality of life, um, uh, well-being. So I, th I think very different attitudes. So I think when we update what appeared to be the case in 2008 to 2020, we realize that it's not just a case of traditional stimulus to come out of it. It's not just a case of sticking a whole bunch of shovels into the ground. We need a new mechanism and new sources of growth in Canada. Their traditional ones aren't working. So one would want to focus on clean growth because it's a good thing to have, but you can get there from going at the opposite end. It almost comes out of the residual. You go through all the other list of the usual suspects and they're not looking so promising anymore. So you'll come from it from both a positive and a negative perspective. I'll just close on a remark. Um, anybody who is familiar with Canadians, you will realize we are trained from birth to instinctively and almost singularly compare ourselves to Americans. That's quite natural given our tight relationship and our close fiscal proximity. And that gives a bit of doom and gloom um, because what's the point of doing anything here when nothing's happening in the United States? Although uh, there's two things I think Canadians need to realize. The first brought out by the chart that you just saw, what we focus on right now is the rhetoric in the United States. Interestingly, the action in the United States is a little bit different than the rhetoric. But secondly, we need to broaden our horizons and realize the economic and, and population universe does not just consist of North America. Um, there are other things going around in the world and so many, many things, including the environment, the European economies offer more of a model for us uh, going forward. And, and that uh, closing note, I, I welcome the perspective of this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I hope that we can indeed follow, uh, learn from the European examples and also ensure that our greenhouse gas trajectory approximates more closely to a European one than an American one because we, uh, we rival them for emissions per capita at the top of the charts and this, uh, the Europeans are much further down. I'm now going to turn to Richard Florizone, uh, who is the president and CEO of the International Institute for Sustainable Development. He was also most recently the chair of the Task Force for a Resilient Recovery, which just reported uh, lots of information in this space. Uh, many of you will like to look at that report if you haven't seen it already. Richard, what's your perspective and thinking in this space? 
Well, thanks, Diana. So much to talk about here. Uh, and and I couldn't help but note, if you could draw some threads between Ambassadors uh, Rispel and Zbarwasser and, and Don's comments. Um, Remember, everyone should be hearing those words about growth and opportunity, um, sources of future growth, Don talked about. And that's really important because we do get locked in, as Don said, into kind of this U.S.-focused debate and because of the politics in Canada about kind of the, the uh, you know, beating ourselves over the head, uh, which maybe we should do on our environmental track record. But what's happening here, and it's much more apparent in Europe, is, is, is a transition and sources of future growth that, frankly, if Canada doesn't pay attention to, we'll lose our international competitiveness. So it's become, I think, an issue as much about our economic growth and our industrial competitiveness as it is about the environment. Um, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, but first to look backwards, as you've asked uh, Diana to, to talk about 0809 and lessons, I think overall I'd say, you know, I think we all agree, let's not try to repeat the mistakes of the past. There was clearly a missed opportunity in 0809, as, as Don talked about um, Sometimes it was in the scale uh, uh, of the stimulus, but also in the direction of it. I think it generally locked us more into into higher carbon pathways rather than the alternative. And there's lots of reasons for that, including the evolution of fracking and 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 low cost natural gas that that kind of forced thing the transition from coal to natural gas. So there's lots we can talk about. But I think I'm more I'm more I'm more confident um, in the future um, because of the kind of growth and opportunity that our speakers have already spoken to. Um, in terms of specific lessons from the past, um, you know, uh, I think from 0809, there were some successful measures, recovery measures that were successful in driving clean growth. And we should look at those. You know, examples would include uh, wind in Europe, uh, solar in China, Japanese uh, electric vehicles. There's some failures we can learn from too, and I know we'll get into this. And that is basic, it basically comes down to implementation and coordination, maybe the devil's in the details, if you will, around interventions. So, for example, in the 0809 downturn, uh, Australia had a major uh, $3 billion home insulation program that's kind of recognized to be a failure, basically because poor coordination to design, where the money flowed and how it was executed. Um, even the Japanese uh, EV uh, incentives uh, were very successful in growing the EV market. Um, but it, it was an example where you have to be careful that government isn't working at cross purposes because in that instance, they also reduced uh, road use taxes as part of a tourism measure to boost tourism. And so that kind of offset the impact and, 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 and GH emissions ended up kind of netting out. So there's some specific lessons in there. Um, however, and I know we'll get into this, there are specific areas that we can now say, you know, that let's not accept, let's reject this false compromise between the economy and the environment. There's a growing consensus around three or four areas. Uh, uh, around building retrofits, around clean energy infrastructure, around investments in nature that are backed up by academic research are backed up by some of the trends we're seeing in Europe. Um, Canada, you know, that slide that you showed was actually the Canada bar was the proposal from, from our task force. Um, Canada, we're seeing a lot of good signs as Don pointed to in terms of the speech from the throne. We haven't seen the reality yet. The fact is, versus our international uh, competitors, uh, we're actually continuing to do more in the fossil fuel area. Right? Now that's understandable, but you know our our kind of recent investments are dominated by, say, the six billion dollar investment by the government of Alberta and Keystone XL. Um, uh, investments in natural gas uh, fired electricity production in the province of Ontario. So, you know, it's still trending towards fossil fuel, I think a bit more than the rest of the world. Um, but, but there's some important signs um, and government has, has set a good direction. And, uh, and so there's a lot of good opportunity here for Canada that we want to build on. So thank you. And I look forward to the further conversation. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, and thank you for flagging up the issue of implementation and, and the fact that the devil is in the detail. And on that, I'd like to bring in Raina Agster. And Raina is executive board member of Adelphi, which is Euros, Europe's biggest think do tank on climate uh, and sustainability. Uh, Raina, you have a lot of thoughts, I know, around getting this right at the implementation level. Perhaps you could share those. Sure. Thank you, Diane. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I think um, I just want to build on what Richard just said. Um, your examples, which you gave in a positive sense, um, they were quite often smaller scale individual investments. And that's where the problems come in, usually. Um, at the moment, um, I remember a few years back in the climate discussion, climate finance discussion, there was a lot of talk about unlocking the trillions. And back then I thought, like, hmm, unlocking the trillions, doesn't that sound a little bit saturated? So now the trillions just have been unlocked. Now it's a question of taming these trillions. 
because um, what we're going to do with it, we can't build endless roads. We can't have big uh, fuel investment, fossil fuel investments in, in energy production only. We also have to think about the smaller scale elements. Um, just talk about retrofitting of buildings, talking about vehicles, talking about um, smaller scale renewable energy um, appliances. And that's the question is how then get from this, let's not talk about the trillions, let's think about billions or hundreds of millions, how to bring them down to loans, to investments, which have 5,000, 10,000, 50,000. Yes, um, um, Canadian dollars or, or euros as a as a normal size, and there a lot of problems come in. Um, we always have this um, has to have this element that we like to talk about a few good examples, a few good examples which are green investments, which are stimulating green growth. But now we're not talking about a few good examples. We need many. We're not talking about dozens. We talk about thousands, and that's where the problems come in. So this has to be usually very close to business as usual. Um, Don was talking about, um, as the chief economist of, of one of the largest uh, banks, um, banks, and we work a lot with finance institutions, they like to repeat things. So that's why they like to finance houses. That's why they like to finance cars, because you can finance millions of times the same thing. And we need to find these investments in the green area. How can you repeat those? Because then it gets attractive to the banking system, and the banking system Whatever you may think about it, it's still the most effective and efficient way to get big amount of monies distributed across the across the country and have real impact. And that brings me to the last element maybe there, which is um, that we also need to have some kind of accountability for these investments. So some actual impacts happening. Um, I think a lot of you are familiar with green bonds um, and it's very, very trendy, very hip. It's, it's trendy hip in Europe. Um, it's trendy hip in, in China. Um, for example, and there's a lot of talk about it, but the problem is that a lot of these green bonds, they don't produce actual impact figures. So what do they invest in? Um, and and these, these impacts and how to calculate them, that's going to be the next, the next big challenge there, especially for smaller scale uh, projects, which are all across the countries. So the main things here is how to get from large numbers to small numbers, how to get from few to many, and the last one, how to actually measure the impact of this. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Rainer. I'd like to just come back to you on one point. And I, I think you make a very valid point about the lack of uh, agreed measures and data and information about uh, you know, whether we really are using this money effectively. Uh, but also, there's been a question in the, in, the, in the question panel about how you actually get the money out the door. For example, on green home renovations or new building standards. You know, it's one thing to make a money money available for this, but we all know that this money has to be drawn down and put to good use. So you need a, a, a stick as well as a carrot, possibly, or a regulation or something um, that's pushing people in the right direction. Can you can you give any thoughts on that before we move on? Yeah, um, I think sticks are are working. It depends where you are. Sticks work. Um, they work in Germany most of the time. Um, I think they work in Canada as well. Um, in a lot of countries, we also work in developing countries. You can have many sticks, and nothing's going to happen <laughs> because uh, there's no much enforcement there. So I think, from my perspective, our experience, it's a combination that you um, you don't put a huge threshold in front of it. So you make an, a quite a simple eligibility check. So it's manageable, um, not for an engineer, but it's manageable for a bank employee sitting somewhere in a branch office. That's one element. And the other one is that you also provide not only, especially on the enterprise level, that you not only provide finance, because uh, interest rates are very low uh, in, in, in Canada and in, in Germany. So this is not such a big incentive. But you also provide some technical support. Um, and often what you find is also in the German environment, there is grant programs and they come with technical support. But then there is loan programs and they don't have any technical support. And so um, they might be not that attractive. So I think that's one element where you can generate additional growth. In the end, if you have such programs, you also have to think about how to generate a pipeline. So it's not enough just to put the incentive, the carrot somewhere, um, where, be, where then when in companies or individuals uh, running to, you also have to, to build them a nice path to go there with maybe a coffee on the way. Thank you. That's very wise. I think one of the changes and uh, I forget who it was, was it Richard or John who flagged this up? Um, that we've got between uh, now and 2008 is a very changed environment within the business community. Uh, in the past, it was felt that it, it was kind of 
anti-business to be advocating for the environment. This time around, we see the business community stepping to the front of the demands for a greener recovery. Um, Someone who is at the forefront of that movement is our speaker today, Claire Tutnui, who's the Delegate Générale of the Entreprise pour l'Environnement, uh, uh, which is an association of 50 large French and international organizations that are working together. They work together with those organizations to integrate uh, the environment and sustainability into their strategy and operations. Claire, can you describe how you and your members uh, or your associations have gone about this uh, in France? Thank you very much, Diana. Yes, uh, EP members, maybe because uh, COP21 in 2015 was in France, have been committed. And uh, we started working on carbon neutrality in 2050 immediately after the Paris Agreement which means that we have produced last year, published in 2019, a study on uh, how, what, what it is to make France carbon neutral in 2050 and what should be done in the very near years. Because what we have realized all together, and this is covering all sectors from energy, heavy industries, to banks and mobility or pensioner goods, so all sectors together have realized that it is possible, but that it is urgent to start with very ambitious measures. And you have spoken about building renovation and so on. So when the COVID crisis came, we were extremely afraid. We all became afraid that uh, the same thing would happen as after the 28 crisis and that environment would, would be pushed back after economic recovery and uh, losing close to 10 years in the transition, the green transition. So while we were still confined, each uh, in his uh, home, uh, we produced uh, this spring, early May, a tribune of CEOs saying we want, we, we cannot afford to push environment uh, recovery back, environment transition back. We need to have it at the heart of the recovery plan. And since we had looked into this, we have avenues, we have ideas, and this will, uh, this will be a good recovery and a solid recovery in addition to the green. Uh, so uh, this tribune uh, was signed not only by our members, but uh, by about 100 CEOs in France of very large groups. And then it created buzz and it created debate and momentum. And I think we, we can be, uh, what we see today is that at least the green, the, the recovery plan is significantly greener than it was in 2029. Um, and uh, we are, there is still, of course, a lot of debate. Should it be greener? Should the industrial part of it, which is not in the green part, uh, can it be made greener? Uh, but uh, at least uh, I think that uh, business has understood that uh, this green transition, transformation, is sort of uh, unavoidable and that if you start early, if you make it into the recovery plan, you can be winners in the end. So um, I think that I, I, I can uh, continue on this plan, of course, but uh, I will stop here for now. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, there has been movement in that direction in Canada, too. We have seen a, a number of CEOs and working in conjunction with Toby and Corporate Knights come out, coming out and demand, asking for similar things. I think we've, we've got further to travel. Uh, and I also think that, that the point you made about linking cor the corporate journey to net zero to the uh, state level journey to net zero more clearly is essential. Uh, and one of the problems is that while most states have uh, made those commitments, they have not really laid out plans uh, uh, and for their own actions, nor for how they will work with corporations. So I think this, that's a fertile space for action. The uh, future that we're looking at, obviously, we're focusing on Canada and the European Union here, but um, we uh, also need to think about other countries and the globe because uh, this is a global issue. We need global coordination. Um, somebody else who's been working in the business space, but at that global level, is Sandra Ojiambo. And she is the CEO and an executive director of the UN Global Compact. Sandra, perhaps you can tell us what you've been doing, what your organization does, what you've been doing with businesses and where you are in your actions. 
Thanks, Diana, and really thank you for the invitation to join you all. Let me just first acknowledge my, my fond memories of university in Montreal in Canada. I must do that for the Canadian audience here. But, uh, you know, onto the topic, and as you said, uh, I'm currently the, the CEO of the UN Global Compact. It's the world's largest corporate responsibility, corporate sustainability organization with about 10 or 11,000 members worldwide. Now, I, you know, I've got to go back and acknowledge, as has been earlier said, this crisis is significantly different from 2008. It's multi-sectoral, it goes across geographies, it goes across boundaries, and certainly has really shaken up, you know, um, the entire world's focus. The world is focused on one thing, the COVID crisis. And, you know, what's different, I think, is really that business over time has slowly begun to acknowledge a lot more that business is no longer, can no longer only be engaged in business. You know, we often say the business of business really has to be societal transformation. And in our view at the Global Compact, I mean, there's two, there's lots of societal crises, but climate is at the center, as are the, the rising inequalities across the world. And as far as climate goes, a climate crisis is truly a business crisis. Um, a lot of our business leaders are recognizing that it is important to address climate, to address green growth, and, and really see how that will impact their future sustainability. Without that, there is no longevity in business. Um, and I do think that we see a lot more of our companies and leaders signing up, setting ambitious targets around 1.5 degrees, uh, you know, actively taking positions and lobbying for more support for the Paris Agreement, because it truly is important. I agree the devil lies in the detail. Leadership commitments are fantastic where perhaps we need a lot more effort, support and focus is on the how, you know, how do we get there? And I think within the global compact, what we look at is supporting companies to, to make these transitions towards green and then model those out to other companies and, and other economies and really see how we can build a strong movement of sustainable business. I think the fact is, you know, for every, um, 1% growth in GDP, there's about a 0.3, 0.4% growth um, also in, in, in you know, adverse effects on the climate. And I think that whole decoupling from economic growth and climate is something that we do need to look at a lot more seriously uh, within the business sector as a whole. But, you know, having said that, uh, lots of positives. I think the panelists have alluded to this. We've seen the unlocking of trillions for this economic growth and, and stimulus that perhaps wasn't there before. We've also seen a massive leapfrog into the world of digital and technology. And I think that can really further advance many of the gains that business needs to drive forward. Um, and we've also seen, um, you know, a renewed commitment towards international cooperation now that we've come through at least this first um, uh, phase of COVID and we're seeing that through very active work of the Secretary General at the UN. So, so lots that business can still do, but I do think that there's a certainly a much heightened awareness of the fact that there's challenges and opportunities ahead. Thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, very important points. We've now heard from all our panelists, uh, as usual, we've got less time than we could take and, and that we need. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and uh, collate a conversation with them. I will bring in some of your questions from the chat and the question panel where I can. Please uh, be aware that we, will, we are collating those questions. We are thinking about them. We are using them to frame our thinking uh, going forward. So even if they don't get answered today, we'll try and get back to you or answer them offline. Um, so I wanted to circle back around now with Richard, who's been looking at, at, at these both international examples and uh, ideas for Canada. And just get a sense from what you've heard today and your own work, how much alignment do you think that is in priorities between countries? Uh, and how much do you think this is a competitive environment? We've heard about Canada losing its edge. Um, and how much is it, does it have to be a collaborative environment as we move forward, for example, in the hydrogen that, that uh, Sabina uh, noted Germany is moving ahead so strongly and in Canada is, has said that it will move ahead, but is, is definitely behind, hasn't got its hydrogen strategy out yet. Well, thanks, Diana, and thanks for just a fabulous conversation. I think I'd say in terms of consensus in the direction, I would say there's definitely evidence of an emerging consensus, whether you want to call that green shoots. And I would I would say only emerging or green shoots because, of course, the money isn't all there yet. It differs by jurisdiction. Of course, in, 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 the, in Europe, you're seeing uh, much more significant investments aligned with the green agenda. But, but there, is, there is consensus. And again, it's not just grounded in what people are doing. It's grounded in, in solid research. A lot 
lot of policymakers I've talked to have been uh, heavily influenced by that uh, the paper, and we can share the link in the chat if folks like by Nobel economist Joseph Stiglitz and his co his colleagues Nicholas Stern and others at Oxford, with a paper that came out in May that talked about breaking this compromise between econ the economic growth and, and environment, that it's achievable. And they identified five policy areas, including building retrofits, clean energy infrastructure, investments in nature, investments in R&D and training, that can break that compromise and show uh, high potential for economic growth. Uh, and be positive for the environment. So I think we're seeing that. I mean, I think in terms of whether it's a competitive landscape um, or not, um, you know, well, again, it'll depend on the details. I think, I think there's always something to be gained from partnership, particularly when we can mitigate risk working across countries. Um, and there'll be times when we'll work together and times when we might be competitive. But I think the main insight that I'd want to leave listeners uh, with, and I think the, the leading corporations are starting to pick this up, is you 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 can't ignore these external trends. You've got to figure out and get get in the game. So whether it's competitive or partnered, you have to get in there. So hydrogen, for example, we heard about the seven billion euro from Ambassador Svarasser in Germany. We now know that eighteen countries representing seventy five percent of global GDP have a hydrogen strategy. Now, what should Canada's be? We don't know, but we have to be in that game. We have to be thinking about it. On the corporate sector, if I can just leave you with one last thought, building on what Claire has said uh, and some of the things that Sanders mentioned, you know, I was quite struck last week, um, Walmart had its sustainability summit as part of Climate Week in New York, and the CEO of Walmart, Doug McMillan, uh, just stated, you know, we can't leave this to government, we've got corporations have to lead. And he announced Walmart's target to go net zero by 2040, including electric vehicles and hydrogen powered vehicles by 2035. And this is with no offsets. This was real commitment. He had five or six other CEOs uh, speaking behind him, including Danone CEO Emmanuel Faber, who said, let, he said up front, let's be clear, our food system will not survive climate change. So this is the difference is that is this time versus 0809 is this has become a critical business issue and this is a top risk issue for boards and CEOs and I don't know that everyone is always uh, the the broader community or the Canadian community is necessarily aware of of how high in the agenda this is and the kind of movements that are happening so I think it's I think it's an opportunity to move but it's also I'm concerned about Canadian competitiveness because we get so locked into our regional debates about fossil fuels that we'll miss these broader opportunities so partner compete whatever it is we've got to get in the game thank you absolutely I mean it's, it's remarkable the the rush to make net zero commitments in the last two or three months I did an inventory of, of who'd made what commitments at the beginning of the summer uh, it was quite slim and that every week we're hearing people get there. And as you say, if you can do it without offsets, um, it's extremely demanding, but very impressive. One of the things that's come up um, in discussions is the idea of green conditionality around uh, the money that governments are making available. And here in Canada, we had uh, we have an obligation for companies to make uh, TCFD disclosures on their emissions as a condition of getting money. But in France, it's gone a little further than this. Claire, perhaps you could tell us what's going on there and whether this is, is being, whether you think it's a successful approach to shifting the needle on corporate behavior. Uh, it is, uh, yes, green conditionality has been in the debate, as I was explaining. It is actually a quite difficult topic because um, greening a company is not the same for all sectors. It is not the, it's a very different reason, very different level of investment, and the comparison with the level of support that is requested when you face a crisis like the COVID one uh, cannot be just put in one set of rules applicable to everybody. So the, the, the general conditionality has not been uh, retained by the government as a general policy. But what we see is that support to some of the, the largest companies like uh, Renault and Air France, which have been the most discussed because people are so familiar with them, there has been really a popular demand for we need to green them. Uh, this has actually been done in these bilateral negotiations around the support that they were requesting from government. And Renault is, uh, is one who was already uh, ready and is one of the pioneers in electric uh, mobility. And Air France has now launched uh, an accelerated research plan about uh, hydrogen as a fuel for uh, aviation. So this is, a, this is a kind of discussion that has been sector-related and is important. 
Next, what we expect is that uh, another, uh, I said 30% of the French plan is for um, environment or environment oriented on buildings on hydrogen and more. Another part is to in another 30%, 35% is taught industry. And this will be organized through procedures which have been uh, looking very carefully on energy efficiency, on energy transition from fossil fuels. And so while it is not a formal conditionality, we know the way it is organized, we know it will be uh, a greening part in that as well. So um, what we want to, what I wanted to say is really that we uh, we cannot have a one set fits all, one size fits all on this conditionality. But the population, and what the, I think this is another point that, that is important to understand, is that you cannot just make it into the public-private dialogue. You have to take into account the popular voice, the popular uh, understanding of what transition means. And uh, and then you, you put this into the dialogue and you get the condition, you get the greening, even if it is not formal. Thank you, Claire. In terms of this popular understanding, one of the issues that comes up uh, in some discussions is the um, hypocritical nature, perhaps, of government's behavior. If they're also uh, still pumping money into fossil fuel industries. Uh, and subsidizing fossil fuels. And there's been a lot of work done on the magnitude. People are always surprised at the magnitude of state support for fossil fuel and polluting industries. Richard, I know you've been um, in that space. Perhaps you can give your impression of what's going on and um, what, uh, what should happen. Well, thanks, Diana. And uh, you've agreed to let me share a slide and it builds on what Claire said. So we're, we run something called the Energy Tra uh, Policy Tracker with our partners uh, out of our Geneva office at ISD. And uh, you can go to energypolicytracker.org, which we're tracking these commitments uh, globally and classifying them, whether they're, they're fossil, unconditional support for fossil fuel uh, companies or their conditional support or they're, or they're, or they're pure green. Um, uh, and so there's a big website here. I'm just showing you one, one figure from it that you can have a look. And so you can see right from that graph that, uh, you know, since uh, recovery measures were announced, you know, a lot of it is, is going to fossil fuel, um, including in Canada, because uh, as I said, that first slide that you showed showed um, only had um, proposed commitments, but the actual uh, looks looks uh, looks a bit a bit darker. Um, so so clearly there's a lot of work to do here to, to, to do here. But again, you know, pointing pointing to what Claire said, there's issues of political reality and just transition. And it also talks to what Reiner said about how do you get this done? So there's no question in an ideal world that we'd all like to see more investments um, that are clean, unconditional. And, and in this data, it's really France and Germany that are, that are leading the way. Um, so there's no question we'd like to see more of that. But, you know, in Canada, we've also got to maintain, um, we've got to think about people, we've got to think about the region, and we've got to think about a trust transition for fossil fuel workers. So that means, you know, I think a pragmatic result in Canada is early in the pandemic, there were calls for government to support fossil fuel workers. And, uh, and they responded by, by uh, launching a program to fund the uh, dealing with orphan wells and with methane reduction in the industry. That, to me, is a very positive example. In other words, when we're dealing with this transition, we all want to see um, green front and center, but it also really helps us, I think, if we put people front and center. So in that case, we put those uh, unemployed energy workers first, and we said, well, what can we do that will also move the needle in a green way? Um, and what that what it meant is, okay, we could we could find a way that dealt with their very real concerns and political concerns and human concerns, but also had a net positive effect for the economy and the environment. Now, again, on this graph, that investment wouldn't show up as green. It would show up as, you know, well, it's technically a, a subsidy, the fossil fuel companies, isn't it? Because they're ultimately responsible for well cleanup. But it nevertheless moves us in the right direction. And 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 so we've got to push for the bold moves. We've got to find that right balance. Um, and Don spoke to this, right? We're talking about very significant investment here. It's going to be a combination of bold moves, pure green moves, um, but we're going to have to deal with the scale-up issues like Reiner mentioned. And so how to, and, and just transition issues and engaging the private sector. So we're going to need a lot of tools in the toolbox. And so I think conditionality, um, if we put people first and we keep our, our eyes on the economic and environmental goals, we can, we can reach some really interesting outcomes. And that's what we're starting to see around the world. Thank you, Richard. 
the poll that I put up initially, uh, which was about green first or jobs first, we had num- a, a few comments in the chat that it's not binary. And as I said, uh, the green, many of the green measures are jobs intensive. Um, I think there is an issue. I think we can't pretend that there isn't an issue of conflict in those areas sometimes, particularly on a geographical basis. Um, and I do, it's my own contention, people may disagree that one has to come first. This has to be a fair recovery. We're only going to get by and if it's a fair recovery. However, there will be times when the green um, side of us it just just takes a longer term view. And I think the, the view that we're preparing ourselves for a future resilient economy, as opposed to bailing people out in the very short term in areas where we can create jobs, yes, but they're not going to exist shortly. Anyway, I want to let you know the answer, you know, the, the, your opinions. 79% of you uh, went with the green option, 28% with the jobs option, which shows that you're a clever audience and uh, some of you figured out that you could actually vote for both. Um, so I'm delighted that, that, that you know, and that intersection really, that sweet spot is where we would like to be, um, absolutely. But coming back to Rhino, because you've, you've thought about this um, a lot and the implementation aspect, how much do you think that there is um, conflict emerging uh, in that space? Do you think it's being managed well? And, and do you think that we're going to get the best out of the measures the kind of thematical uh, areas of uh, work that Richard flagged up. I think it's um, if you have about the conflict between jobs and, and green growth. I think it's uh, on on a green growth on a green recovery. I think that the actual green part that's going to be <clears throat> more on a on a level that it happens uh, across the country in many different small measures, um, and some of those are connected to jobs. Um, but if you have too much of a job focus right from the start, um, and that's going back to Richard, you might lose the competitiveness there. Um, because um, there's a lot of talk about the, the hydrogen economy, um, but there's also other aspects which might be more innovative in terms of creating startups uh, and jobs, in terms of creating new business model for existing businesses. And there has to be a connection. Um, but... I would, from the experience we see, say the usual focus has to be more on the green side. And I would actually agree that. And then the jobs come on the way. If you try to over-design this uh, in job creation, you might just have the wrong focus. And jobs can't be usually created as easily. Uh, furthermore, a little bit depends on the country context. Um, as, as G20 countries, um, France, uh, Canada, and Germany, it's a different situation. We also work in developing countries. For example, for KFW, which is German Development Bank, or IFD, which is the French Development Bank. And there the focus is quite differently. Um, if you go to South Africa, if you go to Uganda, then you have a much bigger focus on the whole job creation element. But it's also easier there to create jobs with green growth. You don't have to create very high tech jobs, you can also create jobs on a much lower level. So it's very country specific, I would say, and um, this whole this whole discussion in, in this regard. And maybe one more thing about uh, about this also competitiveness and collaboration. Um, we also work a lot in India and, and China. And both countries have very clearly put in front that they want to get more efficient in terms of resource efficiency, in terms of energy efficiency. And they might still invest in, in fossil fuels, but they are very much aware that they have to clearly decouple their energy consumption from their economic growth, because otherwise there's no way they're going to stay competitive. Because the, the, the that's, I don't know the figures exactly anymore, but um, in China, the incomes of the average worker has grown between 1990 and, and 2015, 2020, about 20 times. In Germany, at the same time, this has about double. So you can clearly say that there's a very quick way for them to have a similar um, HR costs, basically, in, in, the, in their manufacturing. So they know they have to be more efficient. And they're competing in the efficiency. Their set is on Germany, on Japan, on Canada, to be more efficient than these countries. And energy and therefore green uh, elements play a very big role there. Thank you, Rainer. We're almost out of time, but I wanted to go back briefly to Sandra and just ask you from, with your other hat on, which is from coming from Kenya, you worked in the private sector in Kenya. Is there anything that we should be really thinking about learning from those types of countries and not just for European countries for our recovery? Um, Yeah, I mean, well, I'll just say two things really uh, come to mind. Um, One, not so much learning, but I know that there's a lot of FDI that is also going to be targeted to 
targeted to um, the developing world from you know from the developing world from the developed world i think it's it's really critical to see that the same principles that we're talking about just transitions green growth inclusive growth are also carried forward in how that fdi is is um, is is implemented and deployed again the devil is truly in the detail um uh, even if i was to take one big learning i think is that um it's really important to keep the um medium and small uh, sectors of the economy up and running they are critical to sustaining international supply chains and global supply chains and keeping business running um i think in kenya a lot of effort was put on that unfortunately a lot of smaller businesses just couldn't make it through but where a lot of the economic stimulus is really being driven is also to equally sustain that sector of the economy because i think that's what truly feeds into um you know local supply chains as well as global supply chains but a principles based response to this whole recovery i think is much needed across the world thank you that's extremely helpful claire i know has one last word she wants to say before i wrap up thank you very much dian this uh, yes uh, i meant that this ecological transition is not only a problem of jobs and technologies and change of techniques it's really a people a, a problem of people changing the way they live and the way they spend their money and i think this covid beyond the economic crisis is also an opportunity that governments or businesses should not discard in learning and keep it, building on this experience that people have had of living differently and uh, taking the best of, out of it and building the new economy also using this experience which is a, it's a it's a shake it's a change people are now open to things that are different and i think we should all build on this as well in designing these green societies thank you yes it's a good reminder that we have to use this crisis well and and this opportunity to do things differently and change our systems not just tinker around the edges with that i'm going to close i want to thank everyone who joined us today thank you again for all the dialogue i will take i will learn from this and hopefully integrate some of the um questions into our future events um i want to thank our panelists who've given us a rich discussion as always we could have gone on much longer uh but we uh ran out of time uh and i also want to thank in particular the ambassadors of france and germany germany for uh supporting the series and france for supporting this event today and bringing in their initial thoughts uh on how we move forward the next event in this series this is a by every two weeks we will be convening for the next uh while so on october the 14th at 11 a.m. we will be looking at financing the green stimulus uh and the role of central banks and the role of infrastructure banks uh obviously that's a, an emerging space in canada the infrastructure bank um but how what role they will play in a green recovery and that will hopefully answer some of the questions about financing that have come in today that we haven't been able to get to so uh with that we're on time uh thank you everyone for being here thank you for coming please do be in touch if you have other thoughts um and see you in two weeks time goodbye yeah.